Ellen. So happy that you are here with us as well. Uh, in September, on September 13th of 2004, so almost 15 years ago, the anniversary is coming up, the General Motors Company had a PR stunt to give away 11 cars, 11 Pontiac G6s that day. Now here's the deal, it was on the Oprah Winfrey show, they gave away 11 cars and then Oprah came out and said, their dreams have come true and guess what, we have one more car to give away today. And everyone began to get excited, everyone began to, to talk amongst each other and think, is this for me, is this my car today? And so she said, we're going to hand out a bunch of boxes. Everybody's going to get a package. Everybody's going to get a box. Everybody's going to get a gift. Do not shake it. Do not open it. Do not rattle it. Just wait until we ask you to open the gift. And so everybody was handed a gift that day. And she said, if you open the box and there is a key in your box, then you are the one who is going to get the last G6. And everyone was so excited and ready. And she said, all right, so here we go. Open your gifts. And so they began to open the gift. And after that, you heard screaming everywhere. Suddenly, you began to notice that everybody was holding a key, that everybody was screaming, everybody was getting excited. And Oprah began to say, you get a car, and 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 you get a car, and, a car, and everybody gets a car. And so everybody's going crazy and so excited that day. And you can imagine why you would be excited. Well, I'm here today to tell you that you're not getting a car. <laughs> I don't have that ability to do that. Now, if somebody in here wants to gift you a car, they can make me a liar today. But you'll be excited and that I'm a liar because you have a car. But here's the thing. I am here to tell you today that you get a gift. And you get a gift and you get a gift, and you get a gift, and you get a gift, and everyone gets a gift today because that's how good our God is. He's given us all gifts to use for His glory, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. As Pastor Allen, as he said, he's on vacation today, and a well-deserved vacation, but as he mentioned last week, we are transformed for His glory. We are transformed for something greater and today we're going to see how we start to use the gifts God gives us for His kingdom and for His glory. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8 today. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. And we're going to read that at this time. It says in Romans 3, 4, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think of himself, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ." And individually, members one of the other. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And so what we see in this passage is that God has given his body gifts. And the first thing we see that all of this is you, the church, the way that it's put together is all designed by grace. Every bit of this is designed by grace. We are, as the church, a family designed by grace. All of this, everything that happens, all that's going on is possible by grace. Paul recognizes this again in verse 3. He says, for, the great, for by the grace given to me. And then again in verse 6, he says, having gifts that differ according 
to the grace given to us. You see, we are all here today. We are all here on this earth. We are all here in this planet because of the grace of God. We are identified with the very likeness, the very body of Christ by the grace of God. In Colossians 1.18, it says, And he, speaking of Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. We have to recognize that, that Jesus is the head of this body. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of it all, and we're just members of his body. We're just parts of the body that all come together through grace to form this amazing church. Paul knew about this in Acts chapter 9. On the road to Damascus, when he, he's, he sees Jesus, he's blinded actually, but Jesus is there and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now think about that. Jesus doesn't say I am Stephen, the one that you persecuted. I'm here to represent him. He doesn't say, I am the, these churches and these other Christians that you've been persecuted. I'm here to represent them. No, he says, I am the one that you are persecuting. In other words, if you mess with those believers, if you mess with the body, you're messing with me. Why? Because we're all in this together. I am the head of the body is what Jesus is saying there. There was a renowned surgeon just to kind of bring all this together, his name is Paul Brand, and he wrote this in one of his books. And so listen to what he says and how he brings about the, the he's talking about the cells of our body. So listen to what he says and how he brings it together to represent the body of Christ and his church. He says this, I am first struck by their variety, speaking of those cells. Chemically, my cells are almost alike, but visually and functionally, they are as different as animals in a zoo. Red blood cells, discs, resemble lifesaver candies voyaging through my body, loaded with oxygen to feed the other cells. Muscle cells, which absorb so much of the nourishment, are sleek and supple full of coiled energy. Cartilage cells with shiny plaque nuclei look like little bunches of black-eyed peas glued tightly together for strength. I think he was speaking to me because he knew to use the analogy of food, so he's got some candy and some black-eyed peas, and so I understand what's going on here. He says, bone cells live in rigid structures that exude strength. Cutting cross-section, bones resemble tree rings, overlapping strength with strength, offering in pliability and sturdiness. In contrast, skin cells from undulating patterns of softness and texture that rise and dip give shape to our beauty, to our bodies. They curve and jut in unpredictable angles so that every person's fingerprint is different and everyone's face is unique. The king of cells, the one that I have devoted much of my life studying, is the nerve cell, he says. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it incredible that people devote their life to these things so that we can just read about these? The king of cells, again, is the nerve cell. It is a spider-like cell. It branches out and unites the body with a computer network of dazzling sophistications. Its axons, wires, carrying distant messages to and from the brain can reach a yard in length. He says, I never tire of viewing these specimens. But listen to this. He says, My body employs a bewildering zoo of cells, none of which individually resembles the larger body. Just so, Christ's body comprises an unlikely assortment of humans. Unlikely is precisely the right right word, he says, for we are decidedly unlike one another and the one whom we follow. From whose design comes these comical human shapes who so faintly reflect the idea of this body as a whole? The body of Christ, like our own body, is composed of individual, unlike cells that are knit together to form one body. He is the whole thing. 
And so we have to understand, I love this picture of the cells. You are a part of the cells that make up the body of Christ. You have different functions. You have different things. You look different. You move in different ways. But it all comes together for the same purpose, to make the body of Christ work the way that it's supposed to work. So again, it's no accident, I think, that God describes us as the body of Christ. And so we see that we are equipped by grace. We are designed by the grace of God, and we are equipped by grace. Again, you've got to understand that all of this is because of grace. The Spirit of God will personally equip each one of us with a gift of grace that we can use for His glory to build his kingdom, to build his church. And so we've got to understand that from ourselves, we, we really can't do anything, but from God, we can do everything. We don't have the ability within ourselves to build his kingdom, but with God and his gifts, we can do great things for his kingdom. And Paul says that in verse 3. He says, Do not think, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. He uses the word think right there three times, actually four, because the the sober judgment means to think with sound mind. And so he's using this word think, but the word think says basically, hey, don't think too highly of yourself. In other words, use the gifts Use the mind of Christ. Use that thinking to walk through this life, to do what God has called us to do. Because if if we humble ourselves and say, you know what, it's not about me. It's not about my wants. It's not about my thinking. It's not about even, you know, my life. It's about his life. It's about his thinking. It's about what Christ wants me to do. So don't think too highly of yourself, he says. And so we have to remember that. We have to remember that these gifts that he gives us are for a purpose, and that purpose is to build his kingdom. Do not forget that. And so we are equipped with these gifts to walk through this life to build the kingdom of God and his glory. So we are equipped by grace, but we're also empowered by grace. Again, we see at the end of verse 3 that our faith, our gifts, They've all been assigned by God. Now talk about power. He's all-powerful. He has everything we need. And we have everything we need in Christ to do what he calls us to do. But he says he empowers us. He assigns these gifts to us. And he empowers us with the Spirit. In 1 Peter 4, when he's talking about using these gifts that God has given us, he writes this, he says, By the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. You see, we've been given these gifts, they've been supplied to us so that in everything we have the strength to glorify Jesus Christ. That's the goal of what we have today. That's the goal of of these gifts. That's the goal of it all. And so God gives us these gifts of grace and then he gives us the grace to put these gifts into action. And so we have to recognize that it's all by the grace of God that anything happens in this life. That we woke up today to come here today to 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 go to the Denellen campus today to serve God. Some of us are serving today. Some of us are here to hear God's word today. But hopefully we leave today all recognizing that we have gifts. And those gifts can be used on Sundays, on Mondays, on Tuesdays, all throughout the week to glorify God and to build his kingdom. So not only is all of this designed by grace, but it's diversified by gifts. It's diversified by gifts. We have all of these gifts that God gives us. We don't all have the same gift, by the way. That would be boring. I would be very bored if everybody had the same gift and everybody did the same thing. And also, it wouldn't be functionally very great. You know, 
if we all did the same thing. And so that's the beauty of, of it all. We're one body, but we have many gifts. And we all bring something different to the table. And that's okay. It's okay if you don't have a gift that somebody else does. It's okay that maybe, maybe you want to do something, but God has gifted you in another way. But it's okay because God has gifted you for a purpose to use that gift. And so we see that everyone counts. That in this life, in this thing, everyone counts. In the way that God is doing it, everyone counts. Everyone has a gift and they contribute differently. And this is exactly how God designed it. God wanted it this way. I brought a few things from my uh, kitchen this morning, and I want to show you some of these things. You may or may not recognize these. I may or may not recognize them either, because I probably don't use them as often as I should. But this, anyone have a clue? A cheese grater, yes. So this cheese grater was uniquely designed to do what? To grate cheese. Like someone was sitting there one day and was like, this is really hard, and I want the cheese to be really small. What do I do about this? And so they created this thing to where all you have to do is throw cheese over it. You can make it tiny, you can make it really big, you can make it... And guess what? It makes little strips of cheese. And then I brought this. This is an apple core slicer thingy, right? So you put your apple there, you put it down, boom, it pops the core through there. You can pop that core out. It's very useful with Kai, my son. He, he enjoys the apples, but does not enjoy the core. Actually, he would probably try to eat that too, but... This was designed for a specific purpose. And this little thing, it separates the egg white and the yolk. I have no idea what it's called, but that's what it does. And so, these were made for a specific purpose. Now, what if one day this uh, egg white separator thing decided, you know what? I feel like I'm going to uh, core an apple today. And so he goes and he tries and he tries and it doesn't work. And what if one day this apple core decided, you know what, I'm going to grate some cheese. Now he could probably cut some big slices of cheese, but he's not going to be a great cheese grater. Now the point is, these things are uniquely made for a purpose. But in the same way, God has designed you for a purpose to do a certain thing in your life, and he's gifted you with a function so that you can build the, the glory of God. Those things work for a specific purpose in the kitchen. But you have a gift that works even greater than that. It's for a greater purpose for the glory of God. And so you have to understand that even though your gift may be different, it counts, it's unique, and it works. And God specifically designed you for that purpose. Isn't that a good thing to know? Doesn't that, that, make, doesn't that free you today to know, you know what, God gifted me with this and I'm going to use this gift for him today. That is very freeing because you don't have to wake up and think, whew, I need to try to get good at this gift or get good at this thing because God has already given you a gift and empowered you to use it for his glory. You just have to use it. In 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 26, it says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need to you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be, may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And that's the whole point of it all. <clears throat> Nothing is insignificant. They just do different things. But we're all one body, and when we rejoice together. When one rejoices, we rejoice together. When one suffers, we suffer together. When we need prayer, we pray together. We live this life together because we're one body and we have the head of Jesus Christ. No one is more superior and no one is inferior. We're all the same 
body. Everyone contributes. Everyone contributes. In verses 6 through 8 there, it says this, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And so everyone, it says, contributes. We all work and we all serve and we all do things in the glory of God. And so God has uniquely gifted you with what he wants you to have. You, I know we're saying this a lot today, but you've got to understand that, that God has given you exactly what you need. God just didn't look at Kevin today or 10 years ago and say, whoa, 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 wow, who, oh, that's Kevin. What am I going to do with Kevin? What am I going to do with him? He's, uh, he doesn't necessarily like to be on stage, and he doesn't like to be in front of people, but, I, you know, maybe I can push him up there. No. When God formed me in the womb, remember Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, it says, I knew you. He knows you. He knows you, and he knows you, and he knows you, and he knows he knew you. He knew exactly what gift to give you. He knew exactly where you were going to be to where you can use that gift. He knew exactly what church you were going to be at today so that you could serve. He knows everything about you, and it wasn't a surprise. His gift wasn't flippant. He gave you the gift that you needed so that you could serve him and maximize his glory. And that means your gift, whatever it is, is not insignificant. It's not insignificant. On the contrary, the gift that God has given you has the power to do great things for his kingdom through him. So not only are we designed by grace and diversified by gifts, but the body of Christ is destined for glory. The body of Christ is destined for glory. If you read on in the book of Romans, so all of this this from Romans 1 all the way leads up, as, he, as Pastor Allen was talking about last week, through chapter 11. And then you've got the therefore there in the first part of chapter 12. Well, all of this culminates, and, he, and Paul keeps talking. And this is kind of where it culminates in, in chapter 15 and then on into 16. Paul says this about the body of Christ and how it is destined for glory. He said, in Christ Jesus, in Romans 15, verse 17, he says, in Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. In Christ Jesus, we have reason to be proud of the things that he's, the gifts that he's given us and the way that we're working for him. He says, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of the signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around Elysium, or Elycrium, sorry, I have filled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But it is written... Those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. And so he says, all of these things are because of Christ. All of this power we have is for him. All of the glory and all of the things that are happening here are going to our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to God. And so we have to remember, this is all for a Savior Worthy of all praise. Everything we do is for this Savior who is worthy of our praise, who is worthy of our service, who is worthy of our glory, who is worthy of our honor. And so every time we come to this church and serve, every time we use this gift outside of the church, because remember, we are the body of Christ, right? We are the church. And so every time we go out, every time we use that gift, it's for Him. It's for a Savior who is worthy of all praise. And when we use that gift, and when we bring others to his throne, and when we bring people to see him, he is glorified through that, and the kingdom is built. 
It is all for Christ. Everything we do is for Jesus Christ. When you wake up, when you go to work, when maybe you go to the golf course for the <laughs> whatever it is, whatever you do in the day throughout the week, how are you incorporating the gift that God has given you for His glory? Are you using it to reach people for Him? Because here's, here's the thing. This morning, if this was just the church, if, if maybe this is the only time you think about the church, you think about God, you think about Jesus, maybe this morning is the only time that you think about those things. Are you maximizing the gift that God has given you on Sunday morning? Like right now? Because right now it just looks like, you know, Sandy sang this morning and Pastor Jeff did some things. And we have Ariel back there in the back. I give Ariel a hand because she does a great job. But most of Sunday morning we see people sitting. <laughs> and not that there's anything wrong with that part because we love to get together. We're told to gather together, not to not forget to do that. And so we gather together, we hear God's word, we worship together, we encourage each other. That part's okay. And so I'm not slamming Sunday at all, but just notice, we don't get to maximize all of our gifts here on Sunday morning. But God has gifted you in a certain way that you can maximize that gift in your life throughout the week. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. And so when we leave these doors today, You're still the body of Christ. And so you go into this world and you use your gift to serve Him. Maximize your gift. You know what? If you can use your gift on Sundays, use it on Sundays. We have many spots that we need to fill. But we also have many things happening here throughout the week and in the community throughout the week to where you can use your gift for the glory of God. And so maximize your gift. So it's all for Christ. It's for a Savior worthy of praise, but it's for a mission that will prevail. It's for a mission that will prevail. Nothing is going to stop us. Nothing is going to stop the kingdom of God. It's done. Christ has gained the victory. And He allows us to be a part of what He's doing here on this earth. He allows us to be a part of building His kingdom and bringing people to Him. And so He's gifted you with these gifts uniquely for Him and for His kingdom. This mission will prevail. And so as you go out during the week, you have to remember that. Ah, my gift may seem in insignificant. I, I, I can't do much, but I know this is what God has gifted me to do but remember, you're going out onto the battlefield and you've already won the war. The war has been won. The battle has been won. Christ is victorious. And so whatever it is, whatever gift is given you, the mission will prevail. After World War II, there was a group of German students who volunteered to help rebuild an English cathedral. There had been several German bombs that had hit the cathedral. It was in shambles in certain places. And so these students wanted to help rebuild this cathedral. And so as they worked and progressed and things were happening with the building and the cathedral, they noticed there was a statue of Jesus. And the statue of Jesus had been hit. But the Jesus statue had his arms outreached. And beneath his arms it said, come unto me. The problem was, during the war, the hands had been knocked off the statue. And so after discussing and trying to figure out what they were going to do with the statue and how they were going to try to fix these arms, 
they realized that they were going to just let the hands continue to stay missing. And instead of rebuilding the statue or bringing in a new statue or fixing the arms, they were going to let the statue stand with no hands. And they changed the inscription. Instead of come unto me, they changed it to this. Christ has no hands but ours. Christ has no hands but ours. And we have to recognize that today. We are his hands. We are his feet. The word of Jesus Christ is within us. And we are to share that with the world around us. We are to serve the world around us. You have a gift. You are his hands. You are his feet. You are his body. And so you have a gift and you can serve him. So again, you have a gift, you have a gift, you have a gift, you have a gift. We all have a gift. The difference is, will you use it for him today? Will you use it for him? Because in Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. But then he says, and lo, guess what? I am always with you to the end of the age. You see, God has given us this task, but he hasn't left us unprepared. He's given us exactly what we need to do what he's called us to do. The difference is some people use it and some people don't. Will you, as the church, use the gift that God has given you for his kingdom and for his glory? Will you use it? And here's the thing. If you don't know Jesus today, guess what? He's got an even greater gift. And that gift is himself. So I don't assume that everybody here, I don't assume that everyone in Denellen knows Jesus. But I'm here to tell you today that the grace of God is so wonderful and that he's, God sent his son to die for you. He loved us so much that he sent his son to die, to pay the price for our sins so that you could know him. And like I said earlier, he defeated death. He rose from the grave. And he stands victorious, interceding with God today. And guess what? He wants you to be a part of all of that. And so today, you've got to first see Jesus as your Savior. But after that happens, guess what? He's got a great gift for you so that you can walk through this life. So that you don't have to be unprepared in this world. So that you know a purpose. He's given you a gift to serve him. So that's the greatest gift of all. But after that, he gives us so many more gifts to serve him. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly 